I'd like to welcome you to this broadcast from Londonderry Free Presbyterian Church. And I'm glad that you can join with us for this time as we turn to the Word of God and consider what it has to say to us. But before we do so, I would encourage you all to join with me in prayer and let us seek the Lord for his help. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we turn to you now in our time of need and we thank thee for your blessed word. We thank thee that it is life-giving, that it is, O oh Lord, the word of truth. And we pray that, Lord, our hearts will be receptive to thy word. We ask that, Lord, you will open our minds to what the word has to say. We pray that Christ will be uplifted and glorified. We pray that the Spirit will take his own blessed word and apply it to our hearts. We pray that sinners will be brought into reconciliation with God the Father. O oh Lord, we pray that in these days you will minister to us, that we will know God speaking to us. And we pray that his word, O oh Lord, will be within our lives a living word. O oh Lord, we ask that as the gospel goes forth into the nations and to the ungodly, that it will fall upon good ground that has been prepared by the Lord. And we ask that we will see fruit coming from the preached word and from the ministry of the gospel. And so, Lord, we ask for thy hand to be upon us for this time. In Jesus' precious name we ask. Amen. Well, could you turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis and the chapter 6? Genesis chapter 6, and I want to consider with you one verse, the verse 3. Genesis chapter 6, and we'll read together from verse 3. And the word of God says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his day shall be an hundred and twenty years. Amen. The Bible as a whole is the word of God. And as such, it is God's message to the world. The scriptures, therefore, can be described as the Lord speaking to us, as God's word to us. And that is something that we should not take lightly or irreverently, we ought to receive it with care and with an attitude of obedience. However, within the Word of God, there are statements that are recorded that are attributed to have come directly from the mouth of the Lord. For instance, we read of words such as, The Lord said, or God spoke unto a particular individual. Now, this is not to say that the rest of Scripture does not proceed from God. But whenever we read in the Word of God of, of God speaking, it is an indication of the vital nature of the words which we are considering. And such is this text, Genesis 6 and the verse 3, where we read, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. These are words which should arrest the attention of every person and of every individual to whom these words come, for they come with divine authority. They carry both hope and warning to those who hear it. God says that he will not always strive with man because he is flesh. And the word flesh there refers to our human nature. It's speaking of man's frail and erring nature. And so man is a corrupt and a carnal and, an, and ungodly by nature. He is a fallen creature. And this state of men in sin will not be allowed to continue on indefinitely by the Lord. 
Because man has fallen, because man is a sinner, God will not let him continue in sin forever. Here in the context of this verse, the Lord places a restriction upon the people in those days prior to the flood of 120 years. And that is a reference to a time of repentance granted to the whole world. It was a time whenever God waited and God was long suffering. And that time ended whenever the flood came upon the world. Surely then these words show that the Lord is both patient and loving and just. Now while the Lord spoke these words thousands of years ago, yet his word continues to have applicability to the world today. Even as God's word came to people in Noah's day, in their sin and in their rebellion, and demanded of them that they would listen to the word of God, and urged them to be attentive to the word and to respond to the word, so too that is true of you. God's word continues to be spoken and to be preached and proclaimed in this world, and it demands that you listen. And I would encourage you to listen to what God has to say. Do not block it out. Do not simply turn away from it without considering it. Receive the word of God as being wise counsel. Receive it with care. Receive it as something that is for your good. And God does speak to us for our good. We read in Hebrews 4 and the verse 7, If you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. And how tragic it is that so many today, when they hear God's voice, do harden their hearts. And they rebel and they resist and they reject. But I would urge you not to do so, to consider God's word. And I want to consider from this verse God's message to the unsaved. And if you're unsaved, then I would exhort you to take this time to consider what God is saying to you. First of all, there is in this message a great need. A great need. Consider the text. God says, my spirit shall not always strive with man. Now the great need presented to us belongs to man because it is upon man that the spirit strives. And so implied within this statement is the fact that without the intervention of God, man would be lost. Man would have no hope. If the spirit didn't strive upon man, he would be lost. But I want you to ask the question, why does God speak of striving with men? What is the necessity for this drawing that the Lord threatens to relinquish? Why is it so important and necessary that God so strive with men? And it is for this reason that man is not in a relationship with God. Man is not at peace with God. And isn't that exactly the case in your life if you're not saved? You're not at peace with God. You're not in fellowship with God. You don't know God and you don't seek to have a relationship with him. The word of God tells us that we're at enmity with God. There is this hatred, this alienation in our hearts toward him. We're rebellious to him. We don't want to draw near to him and know him. How tragic this is. Because man was created by God to know God and to have a relationship with God. Man is a spiritual being. He has a soul by which he can commune with his maker. Man was designed and formed from the beginning 
to commune with the Lord. But sadly, this is not the case anymore. Man is in great need because of sin. In the garden, our first parents had blessed fellowship with God, but sin ruined it all. The entrance of sin into this world brought about the severing of that blessed fellowship between God and men, because sin is the transgression of God's law. And man's sin offended the Lord. Sin is in effect treason against God because it is committed in rebellion and revolt to the Lord. This was exactly the charge brought against Judah by the Lord for their sin. If you turn with me for a moment to Jeremiah 5 and the verse 23. Jeremiah chapter 5 and the verse 23. And there the Lord says, But this people hath a revolting and a rebellious heart. They are revolted and gone. So there is the heart of men in sin. They're revolting. They're rebellious. And this rebellion has caused us to turn away from God. And sin has cut us off from God. The Lord is of too pure eyes than to behold iniquity. Sin is so offensive to a holy God that he cannot continue in fellowship with us. But man is also in great need because of his inability. Isn't it so tragic that our sin has plunged us not, into, not only into misery and condemnation, but it has plunged us into a state in which we cannot recover ourselves. We are completely unable to do anything about it. And I challenge you with this thought. Can you live a perfect life? Or at the very least, can you live a life in which your conscience is at peace? And we all know in our own lives that frequently we do things that our conscience pricks us for. And we know that it is wrong. And yet we can't put our conscience at ease. No one is able to quench the, pring the prongings of the conscience. Sin has rendered us helpless. We are, as the scriptures say in Ephesians 2 in the verse 1, dead in trespasses and in sins. Oh, how sad this is. Our text tells us that man, in his inability, needs the Lord to come and to strive with him and to save him. And that's true if you're unsaved. You cannot deliver yourself. Have you ever realized that? Is there a sense within your life that you feel helpless? You feel that in and of yourself, you, you struggle against those desires that are in your corrupt heart and you try to do your best and yet you realize that whatever you do, you cannot turn around the sinful nature that you have and you have no ability to remedy yourself. Surely that is brought out when the Lord says, my spirit shall not always strive with man. You see, the only way that men can be saved is if God steps in and God delivers them. And this is why scripture speaks of salvation as the gift of God brought about by the free grace of Christ. In fact, the very purpose of the gospel is that God might reconcile sinners to himself. That as the apostle Peter says that Christ might bring us to God. And how wonderful it is then that the one who has been offended by our sin in mercy and in grace comes to us in the person of Christ and draws us to himself and delivers us by abundant grace and pardons us. Oh, surely as we think of this, you would realize how much you need him. 
You desperately need the Lord to rescue you. And so there is in this message a great need. But then secondly, there is in this message a great truth. A great truth. We read in our text, My spirit shall not always strive with man. The great truth that is revealed is that the Spirit of God does strive with men. The word strive means to contend, to act as a judge, to plead, or to strive as at law. And so what is in view is the drawing of the Spirit upon the heart of man. The Spirit's striving is all of grace and is sovereign. He is the one alone who comes upon the heart of man in mercy to draw them to the Father. Now what does this striving consist of? It consists of the Spirit convincing men of sin. And we observe this in the sense of the word strive. That of judging or striving as at law. And so the Spirit's work is to convince us by the law of God, to judge us by the law of God. And so this sense indicates the work that the Spirit has in bringing home to the mind and the heart of man the full force of the law of God. Because it is by the law that there is the knowledge of sin. And so the Spirit convinces us of our sin by awakening our conscience to God's commandments. And he makes us feel our guilt before God. He gives us that sense of, of our transgressions of God's law. And so this convincing of our sin, which the Spirit does, is absolutely vital. For in order for you to be saved, you must recognise your sin and the calamity that it brings upon your soul. Turn with me, please, to the Gospel of John and the chapter 16. John chapter 16 and the verse 8. And here the Word of God confirms what I have just said. John 16 and the verse 8. And speaking of the work of the Spirit, it says, And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And the word reprove there means to convince or to convict. And so it is the Spirit's work to convict and convince of sin. And this is essential for the unsaved person because repentance comes before faith. Before you believe, you must come to a place where you see your sinfulness and you confess it before God and you say, Lord, I am a sinner. And you repent. You confess your sin before God. You turn away from it and turn to Christ. And so the Spirit convinces men of sin. But the Spirit furthermore testifies to men of Christ. The further sense of the word strive is that of pleading. Pleading. And so this sense refers to the positive presentation of the value and the power of Christ as the only saviour of sinners. And so it is the Spirit's work not only to show you your sin, but to persuade you of Jesus Christ and, and who he is and what he has done for sinners. Now this happened at this time through the preaching of Noah and the building of the ark. During those 120 years, Noah was a faithful preacher and he also built the ark with his family and that ark testified of Christ as the only hope of salvation. 
They were shown to the people in Noah's day that there was a way of escape in the ark. No doubt Noah, as he preached, would have spoken of the coming judgment of waters. And at the very same time, the ark stood there in its construction. And by such a means as the ark was being built, the spirit strove with men in those days. And the spirit shows to people their need of Christ and of the fact that he meets every need that they have. Oh, how wonderful is Jesus Christ. For men in sin can find no greater treasure than our Saviour. He meets every need that they have. He is the one who is able to deliver them. And the blessed spirit of truth is the one who has come, said our Lord, to testify of Christ and to glorify Christ. And so it is the spirit's purpose to draw you to the Saviour. He doesn't speak of himself, but he speaks of the Saviour. He shows to you that he is the way, the truth and the life. He strives with you so that you might see that you need a redeemer. That he would convince you that it is only Christ, the God-man, who is able to reconcile you to God. Know how you should rejoice that the Spirit would do this. And you should cry out to God that he would have mercy upon you and that he would give you faith to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Or if the Spirit is striving with you now, or has been striving with you, I exhort you, do not resist it. If you have a sense of your sin, and you're beginning to see your need of Jesus Christ, and you've come to some understanding of what Jesus Christ is, and you also see that he has suffered and died for sinners, that he is the one who is able to reconcile us to God, then embrace that and rejoice in it and, and be filled with joy at what God has done. And do not continue in sin any longer, but flee to Christ. And turn to him in all of your need and confess to the Lord, I need you. And without you, I am lost. All that God would so bring this truth to dawn upon your heart. Christ is the one that we need and the one that is able to save our souls. And so there is this great truth in this message. But then thirdly and finally, there is in this message a great warning. A great warning. We read in verse 3 of Genesis chapter 6, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. Now these words, while containing a great message of hope for sinners, also contain a most solemn warning to the unsaved. Yes, it is true that the spirit does strive with men, and that is a wonderful thing. But do not be mistaken into thinking that such a work is perpetual. Oh, it would be a terrible error for you to think that the Spirit's striving continues on indefinitely. Oh, may the Lord make this fact come home to your soul with great force. God is a long-suffering God. But his long-suffering and patience will come to an end. It doesn't last forever. And this is what this verse is teaching. God's Spirit is not always going to strive with men. At some point, the Lord will relinquish. The Lord will step back. The Lord will give men over to their vile affections. And so such a fact 
that God's long-suffering and patience will end, that his striving will cease. That fact imposes upon you the urgency and the necessity of coming to Christ now, of turning to the Lord for mercy now. For you do not know if you will have another opportunity. You do not know how long the Spirit will strive with you. You have no idea when the Spirit will cease from persuading you and from convincing you. The Apostle Peter speaks of the long suffering of God coming to a close in Noah's day. If you turn with me, please, to 1 Peter 3 and the verse 20. 1 Peter 3 and the verse 20. And Peter says, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. So you will notice with me that Peter points out that the period of 120 years was God exercising his long suffering and his patience towards the people who lived upon the earth during that time when the ark was being built and prepared. And so here again we see this great warning because Peter tells us that the Lord did wait as Noah built the ark, that the Lord did commission Noah to be a preacher of righteousness, that he did tell Noah to warn those around him of impending judgment and that God did patiently hold back his judgment. But the thing that I want you to take notice of is that one day the ark was finished. One day God's patience did end. One day the door of the ark was shut. One day the floods began to rise and on that very day all those outside the ark were swept away to eternal ruin. Oh how tragic this is and surely at the very so same time in earnestness I would exhort you to consider what this means for you. Is God striving with you and yet the striving will soon end? Or well, it is true, as the scripture says, that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. And it is only because God is long suffering that any of us could be saved and are saved. But that is not a cause for carelessness. It is not a reason to be negligent with these truths. And such negligence is expressed in that idea of some that they will wait until their deathbed, supposedly, to cry out to God and to call upon him for salvation. And all that really is, is being careless with the long suffering of God. It is tempting God. Oh, the global flood marked the end of the Spirit's striving with man in those days. And death will mark the same for you, unless the Lord returns before your death. Death will mark the end of the Spirit's striving with you if you're not saved. And we are all but a step away from death. Surely this concerns you. And I ask you, are you not troubled by this? Does the thought that God would leave you to your own way fill you with fear? And what an awful thing that would be for you, for God to forsake you and for God to step back and let you go your own way that will only end in destruction for your soul. What an awful thing that God would cease to strive with sinners. It means that there is no hope for them at all. Oh, surely, as you hear this, 
you are filled with concern. And in earnestness, you would cry out to God as you hear the word and respond to the Spirit's striving. Even as you are hearing the word now, you are being given another chance to repent and to trust in Christ. And I exhort you, do not reject it. Do not put it off to another time. Do not treat it lightly. Today, now, is the day of salvation, but it will not always be so. And surely then, if you value your soul, and if you value Jesus Christ, then you will take this opportunity to receive God's gracious salvation in Christ. Oh, hasn't God been patient with you? Isn't it true that he has been long-suffering in your life? Isn't it true that God has waited for so long and strove with you for so long? And as each day goes past, so too draws closer that day when he will end his drawing. And so should you not then flee while you can at this moment, flee from the wrath to come and flee to the rock Christ Jesus and shelter under the rock of ages, safe in Christ's blessed arms, where no judgment can touch you, where you will never ever be sent to God's everlasting condemnation for those who are in Christ are safe for all eternity. Or as you hear this word, would you not respond in faith? Would you not confess your sin to God and ask him to forgive you and to cleanse you and to give you Christ's righteousness and to justify you and save you? And if you call upon him now, if in humility and contrition you cry out to God for his mercy, then God's word promises that he will come to you. For the word of God says that those who seek the Lord will find him. And they will find him to be a God of compassion and mercy and abundant pardon. All oh, that you would do that at this very moment. That you would respond to the Spirit's striving and you would come in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust that the Lord will bless his precious life-giving word. Let's close this time in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do praise your name for this great message that has come from your lips, O Lord, and we thank you that it is a message of hope and warning. We thank thee that God is so loving and long-suffering that he has spoken to us in this manner. We pray that, Lord, those who hear this message who are not saved will respond and will, O Lord, be caused to turn to thee and cry out to thee for salvation. Lord, apply thy word to our hearts. We pray that the word will take root downward and bear fruit upward. Bless it to all of us. We thank thee that the Lord is the God of our salvation. And we magnify and we bless your holy name. And we praise you for all that you have done in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you that, Lord, we can turn to thee in confidence and in assurance, knowing that what you have said is true. You are a God who does not lie. Therefore, we receive your word with thankfulness and with joy and pray that you will bless it to us. In Jesus' precious name, amen.